And greetings once again, AP Calc BC students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School, and we are now in video number two that introduces this wonderful idea of the logistic differential equation. And we're just about ready to tackle some actual questions that you might see on the AP Calc exam that'll show up in our next uh, pair of videos. But I wanted to spend just one more video with you kind of developing this idea of the logistic differential equation. And you're actually going to see a very kind of interactive proof to this differential equation solution. So if you tuned into the last video, you were introduced to this particular slide here that basically said that the, the, the logistic differential equation as we typically will see it in our calculus two or BC course will look something like this. The rate of change of an amount with respect to time is some constant K times that amount times the quantity one minus the amount divided by L where K and L are positive constants, but then we also further investigated in the last video that L is this carrying capacity. It's the highest possible value that the amount Y can ever attain. And then we developed in a, an experimental way the equation Y is equal to L over one plus B times E to the negative KT. Well, now we're going to take this more from an experimental aspect into a more theoretical aspect. And I've developed this PowerPoint presentation that will really emphasize the key steps that's used to prove this particular logistic differential equation. Now, the great news about this is that this is something that you would never have to do on an AP exam. In fact, you can probably crunch out lots of successful problems and answers without ever knowing this, but this will certainly give you a bit of insight into what's happening. So let's take a look. So welcome to our proof of the solution equation to a logistic differential equation. Now, if I go too fast through this particular proof, don't worry, you can always pause the video or rewind and look back at a step that you may not have understood. So here we go. So we're going to start off with our general form of the logistic differential equation. And as you know, that's going to be that dp dt equal k times p 1 minus p over l. Now, the one thing that I am changing here is I changed my dependent variable from y to p. I thought it might make a little bit more sense. Maybe p stands for a population of sorts. L is still going to be that carrying capacity. So. What we're going to do is we're going to have to separate the variables as we do with any logistic or any differential equation, whether it's logistic or not. And so to make that happen, I'm simply going to divide both sides by 1 minus P over L. And then I would have to retain the DP that's already on the left side. And then if I drop my K already on the right side, I just multiply both sides by DT. And well, we have it separated. P's on the left side, T's uh, and, and on the right side. Now, we left off with this equation. And now we got to think about how we're going to do this. We have to integrate both sides, of course. And so we know that that's the next step. But we kind of look at some observations here. We know we're going to have to do a little algebra to clean up the left side. Hopefully you can see that, or I can move my camera view here just for a little bit. So we're going to have to do a little algebra to clean up that left side because that left side is a mess right now, right? So what are we going to talk, what are we going to do to clean up that side? Well, let's multiply the, the numerator and the denominator both by L. Now, if we do that, I think it's pretty clear that you would get L on top. And then on the denominator, if I think about uh, multiplying through by the L, but keeping the P out in front, I would have an L minus P inside with that P still factored out. And of course, the DP is still going to be at the very end. And you've got to admit that that is a bit of an improvement, right? Well, sure, but we still have to come up with a plan that's going to help us take the antiderivative of that pretty ugly left side now. And so that's going to be our main focus throughout the rest of this particular slide.
All right, so where are we at now? Well, if you recall, turns out that we're going to have to perform a partial fraction decomposition. All right, so what does that mean? Well, if I kind of look over here, it looks as if we're going to take that particular expression, L over P quantity L minus P, and we see that we can use two distinct linear factors. And you guys, right there, that is why logistic differential equation really belongs in Calc BC. Because if we wanted to prove or solve the differential equation, we have to use this advanced integration technique that hopefully you've already learned called partial fraction decomposition. And I can't emphasize this enough. You will not have to do this on the AP Calc BC exam. And it's kind of up in the air whether or not this is something that you would do in a Calc 2 course at your college or university. A lot of it depends on the school itself. I do know that most of the schools that I uh, have a, a relationship with, they don't have their students do this because it is very time consuming and laborious, but they would like their students to at least understand the process. So that's another good reason to maybe watch this video. So we've got the two distinct linear factors. What does that mean? Well, we're gonna go ahead and multiply both sides of the equation by a common denominator. All right, so that common denominator is clearly gonna be the P times L minus P. And so when we make that happen, we see a couple of things. We see the left side L minus P's canceling away completely. And the P's canceling away completely. And L being the only thing that's left. So we really cleaned up the left side pretty nicely. Now, if we look at the right side, we kind of distribute the P L minus P in to see some P's cancel initially, leaving you with A quantity L minus P and then distribute one more time there, L minus P's cancel, and we have B times P. All right, so where are we going to go from there? Well, now it's time to solve for that A and B from that new equation, right? And so we've got this equation, and we have to develop a strategy that will help us find the A and the B, and there's really a couple of different ways that you can do this. I'm going to use what we refer to in my classroom as the heavy side method. Now, some of you might be in a classroom where your teachers call it the cover up method. That works the same because it's really essentially the same technique. And Oliver Heaviside you, uh, developed this method back in the 1800s to solve these differential equations by just picking opportunistic values for his dependent variable, in this case, P. So we thought, well, what happens if we let P be zero? Well, we can see that the B term is going to disappear completely. And we, of course, are left with L equaling A times L, and that forces our A to obviously be one. So just with a little bit of investigation, we found our A. So hang in there, we're almost gonna be through this. So let's continue with the Heaviside method. And this time we're gonna let P be L, because as you can see, P being L is a very opportunistic value that will cause a cancellation. So if our P were to be replaced with L, we see that we have L equivalent to B times L, which of course is going to lead to the fact that B is going to be one as well. We've come really far, nobody can stop us now, right? At least that's what he says. So where are we? Well, okay, well, if we were to Take a look at this and substitute our A and B values into our previous equation. So let me kind of get out of the way and kind of look down here. We've got our original partial fraction decomposition now solved where A and B are both one. Okay, well, we've come really far. Where are we going to go next? Well, if we see that if we recall the original integral that we were really concerned about, <clears throat> right? That, that integral uh, on the left side of that equation. Well, we now found a way to deal with it, right? Because we know that that integrand is equivalent to one over P plus one over L minus P from before. And so we can now integrate it instead. Okay, let's think about this. How are we gonna integrate that? Well, the one over P 
is just simply a natural log form, absolute value of p, pretty easy. And then the 1 over L minus p is, yep, another natural log form, except it's a bit trickier in the way that we have a u substitution that we have to think about. All right, and it's a really easy thing to forget that minus sign. And if you're confused by that, what's happening here is that you would let u be this L minus p, the derivative of which is going to be negative 1. And that negative 1 has to be, well, flipped upside down and still a negative 1 and brought out to the front. And then you can integrate 1 over u to get your natural log of u form. All right. So we've got really the hardest part of this problem tackled. And we're going to disregard any plus c constant just for the time being. And we'll throw that in at the very end. All right. So where are we? If we return to our earlier integration equation, right? It's like a movie here. Kind of waiting for the ending. <laughs> we find that the uh, left side uh, was uh, already uh, developed on the previous slide, and then the right side, let's face it, is a fairly easy thing to integrate, right? k times t, and now we're going to put our constant plus c. All right, so where are we going to go from here? Well, one thing I noticed is that we could multiply both sides by a negative one, and I know you're thinking, well, where does that step come from? Well, you got to keep in mind that there is a certain form that we're trying to achieve. If you remember, we want that, that y equal, or in this case, the p equal l over 1 plus fact, b e to the negative kt. And I know that if I multiply by this negative 1, it's going to make that happen. And so there's the multiplication by negative 1. And I'm going to just allow the c to not necessarily absorb the negative. You could but we'll kind of lock that C in. It doesn't matter either way. You'll see why here in just a little bit. And so now from our last step, we're dealing with this. And now we can use a logarithm property to kind of clean up the left-hand side. And that allows that left-hand side to be written as a quotient. If you remember the difference of two natural logs would be the natural log of a quotient. And now we're starting to make big progress. Because you got to remember, our final task, our whole focus right now, is solving for p. So how do we make that happen? Well, to get rid of that natural log, we're going to exponentiate both sides using a base e. So you just let e be the base, let both sides be the exponents, and let's see what happens. Well, on the left side, anytime we have an e raised to a natural log, of course, that's just going to give us the argument of the natural log. And then on the right side, well, we could write this a little differently, right? Whenever you have a situation where you, you are raising a, a, a base to a power, that's the result of an addition problem. And I know you look at this and think, well, that's not addition, but technically it could be construed as addition. Think of this as negative kt plus negative c. That plus can manifest itself as the multiplication of two bases. And if we add those exponents, we would be right back where we started. Okay? And so now what we're going to do is think about that, that e to the negative c a little differently. I want to call it just the constant that it is. Because that's all it is. You take e about 2.71, raise it to some constant power, you still have a constant. But I want to call that new constant C0 because I don't want it to get it confused with, say, the original constant C because it's not going to be the same, okay? So I really could have called it anything. I just wanted it to look different, okay? So where are we now? Well, we're going to continue our quest to solve for P. And we're going to do this by removing those absolute value symbols because we don't want those hanging around. And sometimes this kind of bother students maybe a little bit more than it should. If you were to get rid of those absolute values, guess what happens? You just simply get the original equation without the absolute values. And I know that's kind of confusing. It's like, what makes that happen? Why are we allowed to do that? Well, my explanation over here, hopefully, will tell it all. And this explanation, it says, when removing those absolute value symbols from the left-hand side, 
you got to really apply either a positive value or a negative to your C0, the leading coefficient on the right side. In either case, that C0 can just absorb that positive and negative. And so it's going to be very simple to make this happen <clears throat> when you've got this arbitrary C0. So don't worry so much about why those absolute values go away. Most of the time, students tend to just say, oh, they go away because P stands for some discrete object, like the population of a rabbit uh, uh, colony, and you can't have a negative number of rabbits. All right, so where are we going to go with this? Well, from this point on, we are now going to do something a little bit out of convenience. I'd like to call this C0B. Okay, guys, we can call it anything that we want. I really want this just to align nicely, not only with the formula that I use in my class, but what you would see in many, many textbooks, uh, what you might see in the course and exam description uh, for the uh, College Board curriculum for AP Calculus. So I'm going to use B for that C0. All right, so where are we then? Now we have L minus P over P equal B E to the negative K T. Oh, interesting. I I see the vect. Well, guys, we're almost there. We're going to continue to solve for p by simply multiplying both sides by p. And then, kind of in a little conundrum here, we want to get p by itself. So we're going to have to add the p value to the right so that we can take those two terms that contain p and figure out a way to turn that double instance of p into a single instance of p. And that's just a simple matter of factoring out the p. All right, and so from the previous slide, we have this. Our next step is to simply divide both sides by 1 plus b e to the negative kt. And lo and behold, we have our formula. p is equal to L over 1 plus vect. And as I said before, we're going to go ahead and treat this k quantity, this value. It's going to be negative overall in a growth situation. Because when you have e to a negative power in the denominator, that means you do have growth. So the k constant that we would find eventually is going to be a positive value. And in the next videos, you're going to see a lot of examples of how this might look on the Advanced Placement Calc BC exam. But as I've said before, you don't need to recreate this proof on the test. But at least now you have a little bit more understanding about how P equaling L over 1 plus effect comes about. Anyway, I hope this helps, and we will see you next time. Keep studying your calculus.